Hey everybody, my name is uh, John Hibini, but I kind of run around uh, everywhere with the moniker, the PhD. Um, I uh, am the developer of Soul 2, which is now going to be Soul 3. Um, and here I'm going to talk to you about scripting at the speed of thought or using Lua in C++ uh, with Soul 3. So scripting, why, why would you script in an application? Why would you bother trying to implement or work with that? Well, it's uh, very simple. It allows you to treat code as data. Um, that means you get to extend uh, your application beyond its ship time or beyond its compile time. And that makes it very useful uh, for uh, you know, being able to change behaviors after you've, sh after you've kind of uh, shipped your product out the door. Um, it also allows uh, you to delegate simpler and smaller tasks to uh, a different language. Um, which is incredibly useful, um, especially if you're working with other people uh, who might not have the same level of CS++ expertise that you do, um, but you still need them to be able to at least uh, control some functionality of whether it's a game you're working on, operating system component database, um, or many different kinds of applications that uh, people extend. And again, uh, kind of why, why script, um, you know, again, you want to extend your application, but you don't want to have to do things like hot reload or recompile all the time. And you don't want to always have to try and de define a plugin architecture through DLLs and other things like that, which can be incredibly fragile. Uh, you might change your API. Um, and again, C++ doesn't really have a very stable ABI. Uh, so trying to get something that you can keep between versions can be very, very difficult. Um, so you'd have to, you know, either stick with C um, or, you know, do some other things to make sure that you can uh, extend your application in other ways. Um, it's also about lowering the barrier to entry. Um, again, uh, scripting languages uh, don't require as much setup. I mean, everybody here has tried to use um, something like C++ or even Java or even Haskell, um, and it takes a, quite a bit of build. You need to get, you know, with Haskell, you need to get Cabal and Hackage, and, and you need to get, go to the Hackage to get, you know, the packages you need and everything like that. Java, you know, it's got a batteries included standard library, but if you want to get other things, it's still a little bit difficult. Um, C++, of course, notorious. The build story here is just not great. Um, so really, uh, you, you, you really want to kind of defer some of your, uh, uh, execution and some of your algorithms, some of your design, um, to a different language, like a scripting language. Um, in this case, Lua, Python, or even JavaScript. And of course, the benefit is that, again, you don't have this massive setup that comes along with it, right? It's usually you just throw in the string and you run it with, through the interpreter or whatever dynamic or whatever, uh, uh, virtual machine that you have, and it just kind of gets going. Of course, um, one of the questions I get asked about this is, like, what about the standard, right? Um, what, you know, is there any interop built into the standard to kind of handle this case? And there really isn't any. Um, you know, there isn't really any uh, work you can do with the, the standard library that kind of enables interop very easily. Um, you know, C++, again, is notorious for even, a sta even the standard library implementations all around break ABIs in different ways. MSVC, most famously, you know, breaking ABI every, every major release. Um, so we won't uh, talk about uh, interop built into the standard library because there is none, but we will talk about other libraries and perhaps other solutions uh, that you can use. So uh, what is Lua, right? So this, the, focus, the scripting language we're going to focus on here is going to be Lua. And so what is it? It's a, it's a very simple dynamic language. And when I say simple, I mean that the actual whole grammar of the language fits on one page, right? It's that simple. Um, it only has one data structure in its whole, you know, in, in, that comes with the whole thing, and that's just a table. Um, and it has a very minimalistic library. Basically, it just uh, lets you access some of the C standard library. Um, so it's, it's very minimal. Um, it has a very small footprint. Um, and because it's so simple to parse and easy to generate bytecode for, you can generate, uh, uh, you can run it very, very fast uh, at runtime, right? So you can parse script, you can even parse whole script at runtime, or you can load it off to bytecode, because they have a bytecode, and run that instead. Um, and again, this is all very fast, very quick, and so you're able to get a lot of performance uh, out, of your, out of what's supposed to be a simple kind of scripting language. And this kind of, you know, helps mitigate things when your designer doesn't you know, have you know, a computer science education or hasn't been programming for a while, and he, you know, he makes an exponentially horrible algorithm to do something simple, um, but you know, it doesn't quite uh, tank your performance as much because uh, Lua itself is, is very fast. Of course, uh, Lua is a very famous scripting language. Um, you know, it's used in a lot of games. People know World of Warcraft, and you know, there's literally, if you go to the Wikipedia page for this, it literally spans, you have to hit the page down at least like five times before you start getting it, putting a debt in the list. Um, but it's not just for video games, right? A lot of people associate Lua with just games, um, but that's not 
uh, the case uh, entirely. Um, it shows up in the Redis database. It it extent it's used as an extension point for other databases. Um, it shows up in operating system components uh, near system D. Um, it's used in servers. It's used in GUI for mobile applications like Waze. It, it shows up everywhere. Um, and this is because it's such a, it's such a tested and proven uh, 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 scripting language um, and that has kind of surpassed you know, the t test of time with all these big products picking it up and being able to use it to some great amount of success, um, games like Rectorio and things like that. So the entire VM is, is very tiny and you can compile it with just anti-C. Um, you can compile it with C++ compiler or a C compiler and it's portable to a lot of different compilers. It's everything from the Sun compiler to very, very old compilers that you know, I don't even uh, want to look at because they're just that old. Um, and uh, again, the footprint of the final compiled library and executables are very, very tiny. Um, this means that you can put it on something like a Nintendo DS, um, you can put it in the PS Vita, you can put it in uh, the PSP, a bunch of places, and it all gets shipped into those kinds of places uh, a lot. Um, and again, the Lua again comes with a library that you compile a static or a dynamic library. Um, it's stack based, so you push values, you call manipulation operations to mess with the stack, and you pop any leftover values or pop off the things you want to inspect or control. Um, and it's again fairly fast compared to like, pretty much all other VMs. Um, it beats out JavaScript by a, a, a good chunk. It tackles most of the scripting languages. Uh, complete uh, uh, by storm. Um, it's usually at the top of most scripting benchmarks out there. Um, so you, it's a very, very, very competitive uh, scripting language, um, which makes it very suitable to put in even high performance uh, computing applications. So we're going to delve a little bit into the C API, um, basically how to stack, right? So I'm going to have some, some, some simple examples here of some code, right? So uh, you want to access my table and you want to get index out of it you want to uh, index into it the key A, right, the string A, and you want to be able to get that value, right? Well, in the C API, the way this would work is that you would, uh, you would get the my table global, you put it on the stack, you would get the field A out of my table, and then you'd use you know, Lua2 whatever to get the certain value. So whether Lua2 integer to get an integer out of it, Lua2 string to get the string that you want, or you know, Lua2 user data, and we'll, we'll talk about what user data and stuff like that means later. Um, there's also, uh, you know, if you wanted to call a function, you'd push the function uh, from, you'd take the, you'd get the my func global variable, um, you'd push the argument to onto the stack, and then you'd call it with that specific sequence of uh, function arguments on top, and then you would get the returns and convert them, you know, if it had any returns uh, with the C API, right? And these are very simple things, right? Um, the, the pseudocode I've laid out here is, is, translates pretty much directly into what you would type in C or C++ to make this work. Um, it's, it's very simple. Um, so let's, uh, let's scale it up, right? How would you do this in the Lua C API, right? How would you call other func with the result of what comes out of indexing twice into my table with A and B and with the results of my func called with two, right? It's, it's a little bit more complicated, right? And so, you know, maybe the C API gives us some things to help us scale up and make this easier, right? No. Uh, it's incredibly complicated. I didn't even put the code on this slide because it runs off the slide, even in pseudocode. Um, it's ridiculously gritty and disgusting to actually take that code and make it do something as simple as, well, we say simple, but as simple as, you know, other func, my table, my func too, right? This is something that you would take for granted while you're inside the Lua language and you do all the time, but when you're trying to do it with the C API, it becomes completely untenable and it becomes very hard to, to do this, right? And you'd have to hand write this code for every single time you want to invoke a function with temporaries, with, without temporaries. It just gets very messy very quickly. So, and uh, there's also problems with the C API itself. So I've listed a couple of functions here um, and they all do kind, they all kind of are trying to do the same thing, right? They want to get something out of either the global table or just a table in Lua. And what you can see here is that there's literally four, five, six different ways of, of doing that. Um, and they all have varying performance characteristics and some only exist in certain versions of the Lua runtime and have performance consequences if you don't have access to it. So it becomes very uh, difficult to actually use this API 
to its fullest potential because you're always be trying to think, okay, am I supposed to be using Lua get table? Am I supposed to be using Lua get global and passing the string? Am I supposed to be using get field? Maybe I need get I. Am I supposed to be doing raw indexing where I'm avoiding meta tables and avoiding, you know, cascading lookup chains, right? It becomes very difficult and, you know, without overloading, it's kind of a pain to put that all in your brain and figure out, you know, what am I supposed to be using right now? So what we want to do is we want to wrap or abstract the C code. And the reason we want to do this is to basically get away from a lot of the cruft that comes along with using the C API. So here's what we do in the Sol2 library that I'm going to be using to kind of demonstrate some of these, some of these things here. So what we've done in the Sol API is create a stack namespace. And in that namespace, we create some basic fundamental operations. We have a push here that takes, that's responsible for taking a value and pushing it onto the stack. We have a get that takes a type parameter, t or you know, int, const car star, std string, whatever, and it retrieves it using the appropriate API. And we have a check that takes any type and reports if it's you know, at this index or in the stack, is this, what, is this of this type, right? For a little bit of type safety. And this is kind of what gets us to a type-rich programming state. So it tells us how to push and how to get based on the type and the argument type that we have. And the reason this is useful is because we can use overloading and we, and we don't have to actually tax the programmer to figure out which one of you know, these complicated functions you're supposed to be using to pull things out of things or push things onto the stack. You just call stack push with the value you want and it will just put it into the stack and call whatever API is appropriate. You call stack get and we'll use whatever API is appropriate for pulling out the thing that you asked for, right? So if you ask for a std string, we'll use Lua to, to string. Um, if you ask for uh, you know, an int, we'll use Lua2 integer. If you ask for a user type or uh, a class type, we'll use Lua2 user data and add some extra fluff on top of it, right? And this is kind of where we're getting closer to what's called type-rich programming. And this is kind of what Bjorn taught me when I was in his class at Columbia and what he said over and over again in keynotes, right? Type-rich programming. The idea that the types tell you what to do and you don't necessarily have to keep spelling it out in your functions and other things like that. And it allows you to write a richer API and abstract things a little bit better. There's also some composed operations, right? So we wanna be able to get things out of tables and put things into tables, right? So in this case, we use the same things here. Uh, it's kind of the same principle here. And these operations are kind of just defined in terms of stack push, stack get, and stack check, right? So it kind of just, again, just this incremental building up to kind of lower the C API stuff that we have to deal with so we don't have to worry about it too much. So here's a bit of an example using the stack API. It's, you know, this has been, this is like raw code that you would use. And so as you can see here, uh, it handles um, doing things like pulling out integers or setting uh, keys or, or, or getting uh, values out of a table um, or the global table, right? And so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a little bit more digestible um, in that you can compose these operations. You're not really uh, stacking on a lot of, you're not really having to put out a lot of bloat to work with things, but you know, it's, it's still kind of, still kind of gross, right? You know, I'm still working with the stack. Uh, uh, I, 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 you know, I still have to kind of keep track of where things are on the stack, what I'm pushing, what I'm popping, uh, and all that kind of thing, right? It's not very scalable, right? It's not scalable with developer time. If you had to write everything like this, you'd still end up with the same problems that you have with the C API. Even if you don't need to know which one is the most, which function to call is the most efficient, you're still not scaling up with time. So really, we're just not high enough, right? We haven't uh, pushed the abstraction high enough. Um, and so again, the thing that we showed here is good for a C developer. We want to get a little bit higher than that, right? In the C++, we can have classes, we can have reusable data structures. So why don't we mimic some of the language that we see in Lua, right? It has tables, it has functions, it has user data and you know, user types that you can override and make behave like classes and things like that. So let's see if we can start getting some of those abstractions in our library so that we can wrap this up and start using it. So let's talk about improving this abstraction, right? And we want to talk about references and, and the rule of zero. So abstraction layer zero is working with something what, what Lua calls the C registry, right? And so it's a place uh, where in the C API, the user can store uh, references to Lua constructs, right? And they're all reference counted, right? Um, they're only freed when the reference count hits zero, right? So we wanna be able to use this information and use this, and use this ability to be able to do things like manage tables, functions, threads, and they all have to kind of be reference counted in the C and C++ code that we write. So let's make a rule of zero type. The rule of zero is a, co a, a term that was coined uh, by R. Mar R. Martino Fernandez um, 
you know, kind of runs around with the moniker RMF um, and was popularized in the book, uh, in Scott, one of Scott Meyer's books uh, that uh, included it. Um, and our rule of zero type here is sole reference. And the reason we call it a rule of zero type is because we define all of our copy, our move, uh, operations, and everything that needs to belong on that type. Uh, and we leave it in, and we uh, just leave it to that class to handle all of that garbage, right? So it's basically our archetype if you come from objective C, or uh, it's kind of like our uh, intrusive pointer um, from boost, or if you're tracking the standards committee, it's like retain pointer. Um, there's a link to the proposal that kind of shows that. And so basically the semantics of this is that when we copy, it increments. When we move, we, ref we steal the reference inside, and when it destructs, we decrement, right? Very simple, you know, reference counting semantics. And, but when we put this thing in, this allows a, an incredible amount of reuse, right? So now that I have this reference uh, abstraction, I don't really need to think about managing that for every single high level class I wanna make, right? So I can have an object, I can have a function, I can have a table, and all I have to do is for each of these is subclass from sole reference or compose if you, you know, wanna do, com if you wanna do a composability. And it allows me to get very, very far very, very quickly, right? I can start quickly defining abstractions that allow me to get away from this low level cruft of working with the stack and working with references and working with the registry and dealing with all of that kind of cruft. Um, so as you can see here, we define objects, uh, we define uh, functions, and you know, in this case, we just, we're just adding functions on top of what already exists on sole reference, right? So we have as and is for checking with stack check and as for converting with stack get. Um, we have dot call for function and, op and the call operator so that we can call things that we need to. Um, and we also have for table set and get and we also have the operator brackets, right? So we can get that similar to that API where we can index into things exactly the way that Lua does. Now we need a layer on top of that, right? So we have a function or we have a, a, a table and we want to be able to set and get into and out of these things, right? And so I said that we wanted to have operator, uh, we wanted to have the call operator, and we also wanted to have, you know, the square, the square brackets operator, right? Um, for indexing purposes. The problem with that is that uh, it's you can't have return type, uh, you can't have return type uh, deduction from uh, this kind of type, right? So. If I wanted to have a single sole function type that isn't templated, that isn't templated like std function, then that means that I need to work, I need to have something that, I need to have something that uh, f returns or the f returns in this case that allows me to convert to the type that I want on the outside, right? And this is what allows me to start writing some very nice code. And the way you do that is by having a uh, proxy type. And what these proxy types do is they basically have uh, templated implicit conversion operators sitting on them. And what that essentially allows me is allows me to get this magical kind of I can uh, you you know you can call me and I can return this proxy and I can just convert to anything and it feels like I can just have a single type that just that when I call it is allowed to return whatever I want it to so I can have it return int or I can have it return my class right and it just feels like that because I have this implicit conversion operator that I'm returning this proxy type that I'm returning from these operations that allow me to do these conversions. And the same uh, 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 thought process applies to the tables we have here, right? So in this case, we have uh, some my table, and we say foo, and we say equals bar, right? So I want to set a string into this table at the key foo, right? So in this case, we just overload the operator equals assignment, right? And that way we get tables that we can start setting things into. We also uh, overload, and in that case, you know, when we also, we also have a, a uh, anytime, you know, you also, uh, and, and the same thing, it's the same thing as above for the uh, case when we want to get pull out the string bar because, uh, again, that implicit, op that implicit conversion operator just pulls out a stud string when we want it, right? And that's pretty much all we need. Also, the additional thing is that we can also implement operator, we can also implement the square bracket operator on our proxy, and what that enables us to do is we get to get nested chaining, right? So if I want to look up things too deep into my table, I can be, I'm able to do that by creating this lazy proxy that accumulates keys, and then any time I want to convert, then I take all the keys and I use it to, to index into the table, right? Does that make sense? Getting a couple nods? Okay, that's good. Um, this, will, this will start making sense as I start moving uh, a little bit more too. Um, so, but there are problems with these kind of unicorn proxies, right? These things that convert to anything, right? The problem is, is that 
certain types don't really play nice with this, right? So for example, you know, let's take std tie for example, right? So there's int abc and we're using std tie abc equals this f, right? So we have this function, it returns this proxy thing, and we have this implicit conversion operator. But what the implicit conversion operator asks for is a tuple of int ref, int ref, int ref. And the problem here is that I can't return that from a function, right? I can't return a tuple of references from a function unless those, uh, those values pre-exist, right? But these are integers, right? I'm pulling them out by value out of the virtual machine. So I can't make references to them. And it's impossible for me to make references to them. So this fails, right? Or if I you know, do some funky casting, I can coerce it to work. But what happens is, is that I put the values into, the, into this tuple, into this reference tuple that I return. And then after I return it, the things drop themselves on the floor and I get a bunch of like dangling pointers to basically stack space and you know, explodes my program, right? And the problem is, is that I can't explicitly control the return type of implicit or explicit conversions. So you, know, you can see that here with the, 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 in the struct proxy operator t here, right? There's no return type. It's just operator t and then it has the call and then it has the, the, the parentheses and then you, you, know, you fill in the function with the things you need, right? I can't actually control the return type. The compiler looks at t and fills in the t for me in the case of a template or it uses it to select the right one if you have, mo if you have a uh, concrete type there rather than a template and it doesn't let me choose the, the, the return type. It just assumes that the return type is t no matter what. So this kind of becomes a problem and it, and it, it doesn't allow me to do things like work with tie or certain other types that you know, might not be uh, amenable to this. Um, so I'm working actually on a fix uh, that I'm going to be putting in the San Diego mailing where basically I'm going to allow you to opt in to having this explicit, uh, uh, this, this explicit return type for your you know, conversion operators. Um, and this will allow you to basically uh, be able to perform some conversions or some changes to the return type. So for example, in this case, handle weird tie stuff t is basically just going to take my type and if it happens to be a std tuple that has a bunch of references in it, it will instead change it to be a std tuple of int, int, int without the references. And I can actually return that. And then std tie will work, right? And so that's one of the fixes that has to be fixed through the language um, in order for me to get anywhere. All right, so now we're going to move on to, I guess, another layer of abstraction, right? So we've talked about functions, we've talked about tables, and you can set them, get them, and, and, they, and they look kind of nice. But what we're going to talk about now is user types. So basically, you know, these, 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 these uh, functions and these tables and these threads and whatever else are all nice abstractions, but they're still just abstracting the Lua bits, right? How do I get my C++ classes into Lua and have them behave and participate in the ecosystem and work with everything else, right? And so this is where we start getting to the meat and potatoes of how uh, Soul works. So to start off, I guess, user types are kind of amazing, right? They're, they're the, this primary binding glue that I, that, I, that I kind of came up with, right? And what happens is it exposes C++ classes, their idioms, and their properties cleanly and efficiently. But, you know, I could just talk about it, but why would you do that when I can show you? So let's, uh, let's take a look here at uh, a quick demonstration of how this works. Uh, whoops, that was not what I wanted to do. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, there we go. Um, we're going to uh, give me a second here. We're going to... Perfect, now I can work with this. All right, um, so what we're going to do here is I'm going to give you a quick demonstration of how a lot of this in Soul 2 works. And uh, <clears throat> so there's a lot of uh, uh, ways that you can, you can work with use, there's a lot of ways you can work with uh, user types here. So let's say we have a struct and I'm gonna blow this up so you can actually read it. <laughs> um, let's say we have a structure here. Everybody can read this, right? Everybody can. And see this? Yes, yes, yes. Cool. Awesome. Um, let's say we, you know, it has a var on it, you know, 25, and it's got a function. You know, we'll make this we'll make this return. Uh, we'll make this turn something spicy. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll return. We'll return a new test, right? You know, and it's going to be uh, create next, right? And it's going to return 
uh, var plus one, right? Because next, right? Because you know that's just what we decided it's going to do. Um, so we have this the structure here, right? Uh, and so normally, uh, what we would want to do in an ideal world is we want to be able to say, uh, you know, I want to be able to work with a, a test object. I want to create a new one, um, and I, you know, it's an object. And so I have this new, uh, I have this test here. We're going to make this a raw string literal so I can actually multi-line it. Wonderful. So I have this, uh, this object here. And I want to be able to interact with it, right? So I want to be able to do things like call, uh, I want to be able to uh, get the variable on it, right? So I want to be able to do object.var. I also want to be able to do things like uh, call the function uh, make next, and then also get the var on top of it, right? So there's all these things that, uh, there's, there's these basic things that we kind of want to do. And I need a constructor because, uh, or curly braces, yep. Uniform initialization for the win. All right, um, no need for that constructor. Um, so we have this type, and we want to be able to make this syntax work, right? We want to be able to call a function on our object that comes from C++. We want to be able to pull variables out of it as if it was like a regular C++ type that we could just access member variables on. So what we can do here is we can use what's called, uh, what sol2 calls new user type. And a lot of libraries have the same kind of uh, nomenclature for it. Some call it uh, modules, some call it other things. Um, and so what we do is we say new to user type, and we want a user type of test. And we want to have the name test, right? And what this will do is this will give us a user type. Test user type. Uh, there we go. And so, right, not T, sorry. I mean, I'm in generic mode. <laughs> um, we have this test user type, right? And so what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to uh, say, hey, uh, anytime you call var, I want you to just call var, right? Very simple syntax, right? You know, no macros, no none of that, right? It's just on my user type, anytime you call var, I want you to use the variable var. Makes sense. Let's, what about, uh, what about uh, make next, right? So this is a function, right? But really the syntax doesn't really change. We just say, uh, oh, sorry, it was create next. Whoops, I called it make next, but that's okay. You can rename things and that's fine. Because um, again, we're not using macros and we're not relying on all this other stuff. Um, so we defined a user type here. We said bind to this variable um, and we all said bind this create next thing, right? And so when we run this code, what should happen after we bind the user type and everything is that this should print, you know, 25 and then it should print make next and then print the variable on that, right? So let's see if this works. Uh, I can't see, we're gonna move this over the side and we're gonna do this. So you can still, you can still sort of see, you can still sort of see the, uh, the prompt here. So we're gonna run, we're gonna call lua.script to run this code um, this is basically the script. And when we run it, we get what we want it for, 25 and 26. So binding variables and using them with sol2 is actually just as easy as setting the things and you know, using them exactly like that. Um, and there's also some things that uh, you kind of get for free here. Um, so for example, let's say we had a, uh, we defined an operator, uh, an equals operator here, right? Uh, compare against another uh, another test because you know why not now normally uh, what most people would think is that you would have to bind this right um, var equals right and so normally you think you would have to uh, or write dot var sorry um, normally you think you'd have to bind this and uh, in, in fact, what, what actually happens is that we actually do a number of automatic registrations for you. So you don't actually have to bind certain things like the equal, your qualities operators and other things. It just automatically works. So for example, if I wanted to print, uh, uh, if I wanted to make a second object, which is called object two because we know super original naming here. Um, and we have a third object, which is called object three. Again, super, super original naming and we call object, uh, uh, make the next one, 
Um, now what we're going to do is we're going to print uh, object equals object two, right? We're going to compare two types, right? So let's run this in, uh, and as you can see here, um, what will happen when we do this comparison, uh, oops, and this is why it's a demo. No matching overloaded function. Oh, okay, yeah, we're running into overloaded problems. Whoops, this is bad. <laughs> um, unfortunately, I can't debug this live, but well, now we know that this is an actual real demo. <laughs> um, mm, but as you can see, but one of the things that happens is that we automatically bind these uh, 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 things here um, and allows us to uh, work with uh, the things uh, work with things much easier than uh, we normally would. <clears throat> So uh, what we're going to do now uh, is jump back really quickly. Oh, that went to the very beginning. That is a bad idea. Um, we're going to scroll down. Sorry about that. Uh, we're going to kick off. Let's run it again. Sorry about that. All right, so now we're back in the demonstration. Um, and. Uh, there's, there's more things that Sol2 can do, actually. Um, so user types in Sol2 in general uh, don't actually just work uh, with, your, uh, with, the, the, uh, 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 with the types that you put into Sol2. It can actually work with and serialize with other types outside of the Sol2 framework. Um, and the reason I added this is because it allows you to put your large commercial uh, code base into Sol2 today and use it without actually just throwing away all the rest of the code that you've written. Um, this actually was a pretty big user feature that people asked for. Um, and as you can see here, this is one of the people on, in, in our Discord. Uh, and he was kind of giving a shout out to the state view type um, that allows people to use both uh, uh, Lua bind and Sol2 in the same code base without having to absolutely you know, put a huge effort into refactoring all of Lua bind away just to switch to Sol2. And uh, I'm going to actually give another demo of this. And this one's going to work, I promise. Um, you know, demo gods be with me. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show an interop example. And what this means is that I have a, a separate library um, called Kaguya, right? This is another Lua binding library um, that allows you to do much of the same thing that you can do with Sol2, right? You can set classes, you can add functions, overloaded functions, static functions, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to, uh, you know, I'm going to use Kaguya as if, you know, this was like the code base that I was you know, brought up in, born in, and this is, you know, what the company's been using for a while, but hey, I like some of the Sol2 stuff. So I want to transition over. Now, normally if you put two frameworks together, they clobber each other, beat each other up, and you never get anywhere. Um, but with Sol2, that's not the case. So for example here, I've registered a bunch of stuff on, uh, I've registered a bunch of stuff using Kaguya. But I have, you know, this, uh, I have a state view from Sol, and I want to be able to work with this user type and be able to pull it out and work with it uh, like anything else I have. Um, and what the other thing I want to do is I also want to be able to use this, over, this feature from Sol called overload, where I'm able to kind of have two different, uh, be able to pass functions into Sol2 and based on the arguments you get, be able to switch on, the type, on which function actually calls. Um, this, is one of nifty, this is one of the more nifty features of Sol2. Um, so we're going to run this and uh, pray that uh, it doesn't break. <laughs> All right, so what we're doing here is we're registering, uh, we're registering some of the soul stuff, right? So we open a state view onto a state that we don't actually own, right? So you're allowed to use state view to kind of peek into, uh, peek into a state and turn on all of the abstractions that Sol has to offer inside of Lua without actually forcing somebody to use you know, the Sol abstraction throughout their whole code base. Um, and so we do this. And this is where, this is again using that simple table syntax I was talking about. We're going to set an overload that either takes an ABC that comes from this, from, that was registered and is managed by and used by Kaguya, um, and also a, a second case where we take a second arg and also an ABC from Kaguya. And the, the thing after we register this type, we basically call the Kaguya state, the one that actually owns and manages and controls the state, and we're going to tell it, uh, hey, listen, run this code and call these sol2 functions, right? And the cool thing is, is that it actually will end up calling these two. And as you can see, I mean, it's hard to, to squint and see, but as you can see this, 
we're actually calling the one argument and two argument versions that sold to register with types that came from Kaguya. So this allows you to do a crazy amount of interop that normally just wouldn't be possible uh, uh, you know, with typical other code base, with typical other binding libraries and code bases. And this is kind of one of the tenets of Sol2 is that not only do you not pay what you, uh, uh, you don't pay what you, you don't pay for what you don't use, but you also don't actually have to step on each other's toes or step on your own code base or commit to a massive refactoring just to start moving Sol2, just to start moving Sol2 and using some of the features like overloading and properties and other things that Sol2 has to offer. And yeah, and this is just, uh, we step into here and check, you know, hey, can we actually use Lua to get a Kaguya thing? And we can, and we can even assert, you know, that the value that we get out is 24, and that's all we wanted out of it, and uh, we're all set here. Um, and uh, this extensibility is kind of built into Sol2 and something that, you know, uh, uh, comes with the library. Um, and this is kind of one of the reasons why I, I, was, I was so very passionate about uh, making Sol2 and creating it, because I didn't want to have something that forced users into a specific kind of bottleneck to, to, use our, to use our library or to use another library or to have to force them to refactor their whole code base. Right? You, can, you can actually transition in small incremental pieces to get where you need to go. Now let's do this. Oh, I got it wrong again. <laughs> um, oh boy, good thing this is easy to scroll through. All right, uh, from current slide. Yes, there we go. All right, um, and so a lot of people don't realize that, uh, that Soul 2 is very feature packed, right? Um, in fact, a lot of time in the Discord, I get these very long requests about these things that people I uh, want to do, um, and they, they, they tell me their problems and all of that, and usually what ends up happening is I kind of point to the documentation or point to the examples, and you kind of get this reaction out of them. They're like, wow, they support overloading out of the box, and it got it to work exactly as, as it worked, right? And you cut down the executable size, you know, by, by a light, and it doesn't take five minutes to link, right? These are all things that Soul2 enables people to do, and kind of witnessing those realizations in real time and kind of having them like pop up and say, wow, this is amazing, it works, uh, uh, has been fantastic. Um, and so uh, with that, you know, I kind of want to move into another uh, point about the Soul2 API that I've been kind of working on, um, and one of the problems I've had with its defaults for a long time. So uh, the way uh, you kind of hook into Soul2, kind of like the same way that I showed that Kaguya, those Kagu types registered by Kaguya could be handled by Sol2 is because we have struct specializations, right? You can specialize getters, you can specialize uh, pushers, you can specialize checkers, and basically what this allows you to do is uh, change things to behave uh, the way you want them to, right? And this kind of worked out, and it did scale for a while, um, and users can add their own specializations, um, but it comes at a cost, right? You need to understand SFI and A, you need to understand how to partially specialize a struct, um, and a bunch of other problems that come with uh, uh, trying to make this whole thing work out. And then, so again, uh, for example, if a user, there, there's some other uh, uh, kind of big problems with the way this works. So for example, if a user wanted to change the way int64t or unt64t is handled, because famously Lua doesn't ever actually store integers, it just stores uh, doubles for everything. Um, so if you try to just coerce it in, um, you can, you know, if, you, if the integer is bigger than 53 bits of position, right, then you start dropping, you know, numbers on the floor and dropping integers on the floor, right? Um, and so the problem with this kind of struct specialization is, I mean, uh, kind of. If you look at this this code that I've that I've shown here, right? I'm I'm specializing this templated struct, and I'm using std enable if, and I have to, you know, like put all these mutually exclusive conditions, right, to make sure that you know I'm specializing for the very right things that I'm asking for. Um, and and this is this is uh, problematic for users, right? Users uh, don't want to be specializing these structs like this. They don't want to be working with these things. Uh, this is a lot of like mental overhead to like, listen, I just want to like tweak this thing for my type, right? It's also, again, because I provided a struct specialization for things like N64T or some type that you want, it doesn't allow the user to change the defaults. And that's kind of bad, right? For a user who wants to say, introduce, handle string differently or introduce their own handling for N64T, which was an issue request that I had. So one of the ways that I decided to change this is that customization points are instead functions. And they attempt to call via ADL and priority tags. So you can see right, right here, the new way we do uh, customization points is we have this function called sole unqualified get, or there'd be sole unqualified check or whatever else. And it takes this priority tag type. And the priority tag is uh, what the user uh, would supply. And then they can put this types thing in. And the reason this is effective is because I get to keep the, all the struct specializations I did, but then I add this extra layer on top 
that allows somebody to just define a function called sole unqualified get or sole, unqual sole unqualified push or sole unqualified check, and they get uh, and they get to basically override my behavior, right? Because this layer that sits on top of it before it filters down to all of my specialized structs, I get uh, this all of these uh, 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 I get this uh, I get these customizations that can sit on top, and it prevents the user. Uh, from having to fight with me or have to develop very specific or mutually exclusive, you know, standard enable if SFINA, you know, substitution failure is not an error stuff just to handle uh, my stuff. And so what happens is it keeps the struct specializations from fallbacks and from my defaults, and it gives us clean separation between what the user can specialize and what I have to specialize. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. And so this allows me again to uh, work to make it scale, right? And again, another, another really, really big thing about uh, this is that um, they're just regular functions, right? I don't have to like, like look at this, right? Like, who wants to write this? This is gross, it's ugly, it's untenable, it's, it can get borderline unmaintainable unless you hire another expert to do it, right? It doesn't allow you to scale, right? Um, so the thing that, that about these things are is they're just regular functions. Everybody knows how to write just a regular function. It's very easy. And the thing is, is that you can also export them. You can implement them in CPP files, right? You don't require that it exists, that it lives in a header and pollutes the, you know, the, the namespace and you have to parse it every time you run through it and the compiler has to chew on it, right? So if they're just functions and they compile really, really fast and everyone knows how to write a function. And so it makes it very, very, very simple for somebody to customize Soul 2 without having to sit down and be like, okay, uh, I need to stand on the able if and I can't, you know, I need to make sure I'm not colliding with containers because if my type has a begin and end and it has map type type def on it and a value type type def on it, so it might be considered as a map type and Soul 2 might already handle that and oh my God, right? And it just gets crazy. Separation, clean functions, anyone can implement them, anyone can use them. And it very vastly decreases the barrier of entry, right? I've had people write customization types before, and what usually happens is they just take what I have in the tutorial, paste it in their code, add very little changes, and then if anything goes wrong, they, they're back in the issue, right? Oh, it didn't compile, I don't know what's going on, right? It's, but if I give them a function, they can write that, they understand that, they know how to use that, and that scales with developer time and with you know, your team, right? Your, your, your team doesn't have to have a team meeting about what the hell is going on here, you know, why did you write this? I don't understand what's going on. Can you please, you know, make my life easier and not, you know, I don't, why am I code reviewing this right now, right? It's, it's simple, it's easy, it's understandable, right? And again, it compiles fast. It actually compiles fast, which has been a big problem for me. Because speaking of compile times, they are so high. Oh my God, they're so high. It's, it's painful, it hurts my soul. They're so high, I, 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 it, 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 it hurts, it, it's, it's painful, it's, it's very painful. And of course, the memory use is also through the roof. I had a screenshot of somebody who had like 18 cores and they showed me like the tap, they were building on Windows, they had a task manager and they like, you know, like two gigabytes, two gigabytes, two gigabytes, they're just CL.ex, he's all compiling at the same time. I was like, is your computer gonna be okay? And it's like, this happens all the time. And it's like, uh-huh. And so uh, the problem is tuple, basically. That's what it boils down to. Stood tuple is a nightmare. In, even in just the page here, there's 18 constructors that, a, that the standard library has to implement just to handle tuple. But if you notice, a little sneaky right there, right? You know, say you look at the number four row, right? It says that it's const expert since, since it was 14, and it's also conditionally explicit, which means that you're not just implementing 18 constructors, you're implementing somewhere on the order of 100 constructors doing all kinds of crazy SFINA just to make sure that your tuple compiles, right? And the problem with my old user types before, so I showed you the, the, I showed you the new user types, right? One where you'd say user type and you just say equals, you know, my function, whatever, and it all just works out cleanly, right? Before what happened is I had a function that was just called new user type and you give it the name, and then what you do is you pass in key value pairs without actual any brackets, and you just spam out those, right? Now, when I did this, I only had it for like 20 functions, right? No big deal, compiler's not gonna complain. Then users got a hold of my code and they decided, you know what needs to be in here? 500 key value pairs. And so I have a variadic function with 500 key value pairs and I take all that and I stuff it into a tuple and the compile time just go off the, off the wall, right? The person I was talking about before who had the, uh, you know, the eight CLXEXEs and you know, each one was consuming like two gigabytes and you know, had like the red bar behind it and task manager saying like, this thing is going nuts. Um, 
he crams over 10,000 functions, right? Because he binds his entire entity. He has a generator that goes through his code, generates the sol2 code, and then he compiles that. And when he compiles that, it's massive. Um, so tuples and substitution failure is not an error. You know, that kind of stuff that I showed you on, on this slide, the, all the SFINA here, that kind of stuff really, really costs. So, you know, how do we, how do we, how do we handle this? How do we handle this, right? So what I decided to do, and the reason why the demo earlier didn't go well, is because I got a little bit of inspiration last night. And I said, you know, can I keep the same speed and still remove tuple and a lot of the compile time information, right? So tuple is very good because it retains all the compile time information, right? You pass all the types into it, it retains them perfectly, it keeps them exactly in memory and it's a at a fixed address, right? There's a lot of information that you can get out of tuple. But if I wanna get rid of it, right, I have to create a new system behind it, right? To handle the user types and the functions and everything else that people wanna serialize into Lua and into these user types. So, you know, I changed it up and I got about 15, it took about 15% less time to compile, um, which was great, but we have to ask the question, you know, I had a lot of changes. Did we keep the same performance? So I implemented it today, like this morning, um, in the dark of the night, just for this presentation. Uh, you know, cause I had like the, I like anxiety challenge. And so what I did is I, I at like 1 a.m., you know, after I, after I, after I actually uh, came from the Marriott, I was like, I'm gonna run these benchmarks. I'm gonna, I'm gonna implement this, I'm gonna run these benchmarks, and then I'm gonna go to sleep. I'm gonna set alarm because it takes four hours for the benchmarks to run because I'm benchmarking 12 different libraries, you know, with all kinds of different crazy stuff. And I went to sleep with the benchmark. I woke up and I said, if the benchmark shows me anything, I'm going to redo my presentation and also do, and also do a live demonstration of the new user type, which is what you were seeing before. Um, and this was the part of the idea, right? I get rid of the tuple and I instead replace it with a std vector of unique pointer of, of of these base virtual types. Now this is problematic, right? Because before with tuple, I had a fixed addresses. Once I put it in memory, it stayed in memory. It, it stayed put, you know, unless I, you know, moved or anything and I didn't. Um, now I'm kind of putting these things in std vector, right? I, would, I can't do a std vector of base classes because uh, that will, uh, those uh, don't, uh, those will move, right? If I move the vector, then that changes. If I push back something on the vector, then that changes, right? So it needs to be a std vector of std unique pointer of binding base in order for me to handle it, right? So I can't just have a std vector of binding base star, right? Um, I have to be able to uh, fix this memory location. Um, and I can't just have, you know, things like that. Uh, so I did four things, right? I store the data in a vector and give it a never changing memory address by putting in the unique pointer. I get the data as void star. And then what I do is I transport that as efficiently as I can through Lulin, right? That's what this, that's what the, uh, the twister water bottle experiment that I did as a kid uh, is kind of showing there, right? I take this, this, I have all this compile time information before I serialize it into this vector. I compress that data and I put it in function types and I slimline that into Lua. Then when Lua calls my code out on the other side, what I do is I make sure that I have a function that preserves all the type information and I pass along the exact address of the thing that's stored in this base class. And so that was my idea, right? You know, is this possible to have the same performance as this big compile time structure when I move so much of it to runtime, right? So the sun came up, the benchmarks finished, and I found out, did it. it Sol3 is just as fast as Sol2, and you can see it here with these benchmarks, right? So I'm benchmarking 13 libraries. This was actually a hellish nightmare to put together, doing all these libraries. Many of these aren't even like supported anymore. Like, oh, Lua, the website doesn't even exist for it anymore. Um, I just have a copy on by, by myself. Um, but as you can see here, uh, we still maintain great performance with our function calls and everything else, right? So we're pretty much as close to, about as close to plain C as we can get, right? Um, plain C is sort of cheating because uh, what I do is I just have a std I have a std unordered map of const car because I know that the car, I know that the strings I'm passing in because I'm, I'm writing in C, right? So I just have a bunch of uh, static strings and I just put them in the map. And so I don't have a std string and I don't have to do any, comp I don't really have to create a new std string in order to look up into that map. It's, it's, it's kind of cheating, but it's very nice and it works. Um, and so uh, uh, the thing I, the, the thing here um, is that we're still able to maintain the same form, right? Sol3 is still up there, even though I've ripped out a lot of this compile time information and moved a lot of it into what's typically considered slow, you know, right? I have a, a base class with a virtual function on it, right? How could that be as fast as a tuple where everything's templated and, you know, I just have, and, you know, I just get the, the, the fixed address out of the tuple directly and just call whatever I need right out of it, right? But we were able to make it work. 
Um, and this uh, propagated to a bunch of different things, right? A little bit of performance degradation here, but you know, it, the black bars, which are the standard error bars, are still touching. So you know, it's still we still have good performance here. Lua NTEF and Lua Bridge kind of go off into la la land uh, here, um, but you know, we still have pretty good performance. Um, again, plain C, I I didn't write realistic plain C code. I wrote like cheating plain C code. So this is like the theoretical maximum, which I don't think is really achievable by any uh, reasonable system. But it's, it serves as a good benchmark, right, to know what the theoretical fast is and how close you can get to it. Um, and again, this is the degenerate case where you have, like, where you bind 50 variables, and so you have to do a lookup between 50 different variables and kind of working with that. And as you can see here, our lookup is still competitive. Uh, very gets very close to being competitive with plain C, and again, uh, kind of uh, smokes the other. So um, between here and here, it's not that uh, these two don't support, uh, that you see some of the libraries drop off in support here. Um, the reason is, is that uh, it's not that they don't support member variable syntax like a.b.c in Lua um, when you bind you know, user types to Kuya and whatever, it's that they actually don't support n64t. And one of the types in my long list of variables was n64t, so it actually tanked uh, the support for some of these, some of the types that were previously present here. And one of the other things though that, that really surprised me is that my, in my new system, despite putting a lot of information at runtime, I'm killing it with inheritance, right? So before Sol2 was just absolute garbage, right? It took, I was doing like this weird lookup chain in order to have like implicit base class calls, right? So this is the case where you have, uh, you know, you have a base class, then you have a derived class and you serialize them both in Lua and you say, listen, you know, I'm working with the, the, the derived class in my Lua script, but if I say dot base function, it should call the base function, right? It should implicitly look it up for me, right? You know, it's just like kind of that uh, cascading lookup. Um, so Sol2 was terrible, Kaguya was also terrible. Um, and we were just kind of terrible at that for a while. Um, but in making these new changes, I was able to figure out, I was able to do some optimization and things that I currently wasn't really able to do before. Um, and so now, uh, despite our new runtime, our new mostly runtime system, we actually have a massive boost in the actual inheritance speed here. And so we're actually getting a lot of uh, traction um, from, we're actually getting a lot of traction from uh, being able to uh, work with this new system. So we nailed it, right? You know, for something I did last night um, and set some benchmarks to run, uh, I think we nailed it. Um, but there's still a lot of, uh, there's great performance metrics. We have good performance metrics across the board. But, you know, there's so much room to decrease compile times, right? There's still, I'm still using tuple in a lot of places that it shouldn't. Um, and there's places that I can fix it. Um, but there's also other places I can't. Um, and the reason I can't is because uh, variadic packs of things don't allow, don't allow me to pull out like two at a time. Like I could pull out two at a time if I recurse through them and that's just, that's like the worst case for the compiler, right? You know, I'm, I'm creating a function of eight things and a function of six things and a function of four things, right? And I'm doing that over and over again and I'm recursing, right? So the, the call stack is messy and uh, all of the, uh, all of the uh, debug information from all those functions with all those like cascading and long names just get worse and worse and worse over time. And so, you know, it goes all the way down. Um, and so there's some things that I can't fix, but there's other things that I, if I, that I know that I can process one at a time, then I can use, you know, different tricks to be able to handle that on C++. Um, and so that's kind of the end of my, my presentation. Um, I wanted to thank a few people. Um, so I want to thank the include CPP Discord um, because they actually helped me make these graphs. So these graphs actually weren't as good as they are now. So for example, like they have the swatches on them and the patterns and you know, we have the error bars and everything and the good colors. Um, that was because there was somebody who was colorblind in the include CPP discord and they actually, gave, and they actually told me like, listen, your, your graphs look like crap. Um, and so they actually uh, gave me advice like, you know, and so what I did is that, you know, I kind of went back and I fixed the graphs and I posted and they'd be like, it's still kind of bad. And I kind of went back and forth until I end up to something that looked like this. And so now we get these kind of very, very beautiful graphs um, that have these patterns. And it's not just that it's good for the colorblind, you know, for the colorblind lady who was in uh, the Discord, Ceph. Um, it was also good for everybody else, right? These graphs are, are good for everybody to see, right? And so it's the include Discord kind of gave me uh, a quick um, way to get that uh, done. And uh, in doing that, they actually inspired to give me a Python talk about how I generate these graphs with Matt Potlib. So I'll be actually be giving a lightning talk at a local Python meetup about how to create colorblind friendly graphs. So that was really cool. And I also wanted to thank the companies and individuals who have used Sol2 to success and have recommended it to other people. Um, Corentin, Elias Dallaire, um, Orpheus, Otab Duty, a bunch of other people. And there's also donators who have been helping me out. Um, and also Jason Turner, um, who's here, um, goes by you know, the hashtag at Lefticus. 
um, he actually encouraged me to talk about start talking about Soul Two and Soul Three and make blog posts and actually you know uh, uh, get out and speak. Um, and so that's it. Um, so thank you for coming. Uh, I know you all could have you know went to see Sean Perrin or Hiram Ryder, even Matt Godbolt, um, or even Owen Holmes. You know, which I actually want to see that talk. Um, but you came here, uh, and I very much appreciate it. Um, uh, you know, I've been working on Soul Two for about four or five years. And so I would love it, uh, you know, if you think this would be useful, or you think this would be useful for your company, or if you're watching on uh, on YouTube and you think this would be useful, or you've been using it for a while and you wanted to show your appreciation, I have a Patreon. Um, you can, you know, hit me up on LinkedIn. You know, I have a GitHub, and of course I have a Twitter. Um, and so, you know, if you want to show a little bit of support for the new upcoming Soul Three, you can, you know, ha uh, tweet out with the hashtag #SoulLean with this talk. Um, so thank you very much for coming. And uh, we have any questions? Hey, thanks for the talk. Um, I wondered, since you had problems with compile times for Tuple, yes. did you think about using a different implementation or um, having your own implementation which had like just the features you needed and would compile faster? Right, so that was actually very much a consideration. Um, it was actually the recommendation that I got before from Odin Holmes, actually. Um, but uh, I didn't want to resort to doing that just yet. Because I, I, I know that if I make my own tuple and I just stuff a bunch of types in it um, and just kind of have a very dumb basic you know, tuple, um, I'll get a lot of the performance, the compile time performance that I want. But before I do that, I want to see if I can just eliminate it entirely, right? Because that's still a benefit over having the tuple to begin with. Um, so yeah, so that's uh, a little bit of, of kind of the direction. But yes, I am thinking about just rolling my own tuple for the official release of Soul 3, right? Now, right now, it's kind of just in the beta state on its own brand. I'm going to be merging it into develop soon. Um, but you know, that is one of the things I'm considering. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, hi, you probably have this in your long list of features, and I yes. haven't looked. Um, but how do you handle uh, errors or exceptions across the Lua C++ boundary? <laughs> so uh, Sol2 is exception, uh, can be used with no exceptions. Um, and when we do use errors, we use, it, we use Lua's error signaling mechanism, the, the Lua L error. The problem with that is that its error mechanism is a long jump. Which means that if you don't compile Lua C++ and you happen to error in the middle of your code, it will run right out of your code and not invoke any of your destructors. That's a big problem. Um, unfortunately, there's really nothing I can do about that, right? The most I can do is recommend people that they compile Lua with uh, C++, and so when they error, it'll, you know, Lua's configured to throw, and then it will, you know, destruct a bunch of stuff all the way out of the stack. And, you know, I'll be able to serialize the error as a typical Lua error and get, hand it back to the user. Um, the other thing I do is I have an exception handler uh, that you can override. Um, and so uh, if you do happen to throw in your function, um, what I do is I call a typical exception hand, I call my, uh, I call the exception handle that you can override. Um, and so in that case, you can kind of add some custom behavior if you want, you can catch and crash and a bunch of other things. Um, for exceptions, so even, even if you compile, uh, in Sol2, even if you compile Lua uh, with exceptions or, or, and you throw an exception, I also have like safety catch guards around like any of every invocation of your function. Now, if you mark your function as no accept, I remove those those guards because you know performance reasons, right? Um, but uh, I do catch errors and I have to serialize them in the soul too because if I let it propagate through the C API, um, it'll just trash your it'll just trash your stack and everything will go to hell. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, so. Lua has a bunch of different variants. You know, there's Lua 5.1, 5.2, 5.3. Yes. Uh, there's Lua, uh, excuse me, um, Lua JIT, for example. Yes. Um, what among those does Sol 2 and I guess Sol 3 support? All of them. Yeah, every single one. Um, Sweet. It comes with its own compatibility wrapper and compatibility layer. Um, and so uh, that helps basically cover all of that. But we also thought of the case where you have your own loop version of Lua and you have your own compatibility wrapper, and so you can actually say just to find Sol no compatibility, all of that goes away, and you just use your own wrapper, and everybody's happy, right? Um, Sol two is ridiculously extensible um, for these kinds of things. Yeah, so it's it's been thought of, and we cover everything from Lua five one to five three, and Lua Jin, and even some rogue Luas out there. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, thank you for the great talk. I have been using Lua for almost two years, uh, Sol2 for almost two years. Oh, wow. And uh, Amazing. can you please highlight the difference between Sol2 and Sol3 at what, what will happen with Sol2? 
because it's sold. Right. So uh, sold to at this point is actually completely is like entirely feature complete, right? So the new customization point stuff and everything is not something that I can actually port back to sold to because it's missing some architecture there, and I'd have to make some breaking changes. Um, so what I've done is Soul 3 is going to contain all the breaking changes that'll happen. Now, for the majority of the things that are breaking, really the only thing you'll have to work, change it, that they'll have to change is the way you register user types in Soul 2, right? So before you'd have to say new user type, give it a name, and then you just spam out you know, a bunch of key value, key value, key value in one very long variatic list. Now you just use the user type and you kind of do, you either call dot set and do just one key value pair or use the you know, bracket syntax, key equals you know, value, right? And all of that just kind of works out. Um, and so it's not much of a breaking change at that point. Yeah, um, you know, the reason that we're make changing that syntax is to improve compile times and, and to get these some you know these new performance metrics that we have. Uh, so I think it's a very worthwhile change, but nothing else about your code has to change. Thank you. Yes. All right. Uh, so I think that's it. Um, so again, thank you for coming. Uh, appreciate all of you being here, um, and I'll you know get to talk to you offline and online and and around the rest of the conference.